I wanted to welcome everybody to our panel today and thank you for coming. Um, my name is Lisa Fryman and I'm the panel chair. I'm a professor of art history of modern and contemporary art at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. And I have worked in the museum world for nearly 30 years. And um, I'm thrilled to be um, hosting this. And I'm grateful for all of you for participating. And I wanted to introduce our amazing panelists, um, all really incredible artists. Um, and we have uh, Grimanisa Amoros. Uh, and uh, if you could give a wave so people can see you, that would be great. Um, and um, Grimanisa is a Peruvian-born American interdisciplinary artist um, working with light and site-specific monumental sculptures. Her work is uh, her work's unique relationship to technology engages viewers in dialogue with cultural legacies, architecture, and the surrounding community. In Amoros's work, the past is meeting the future. She was a guest speaker at TED Global, a recipient of the NEA Visual Arts Grants Fellowships, the NEA Artist Travel Grant, and has the distinction of being part of the Art in Embassies Program of the United States. Mm -hmm. Amoros has exhibited in the US, Europe, Asia, Middle East, and Latin America. Rebecca Chamberlain. You say hello. <laughs> Rebecca is an artist whose work focuses on the essential human need for physical safety and spiritual refuge. She explores the role of modernist architecture and interiors as a key tactic of human invention for this purpose. Rebecca has worked broadly across disciplines from painting and performance to fashion design. Her paintings and drawings consider the boundaries of public and private spaces and the psychological and physical impact of architecture. Using materials such as lithography, ink, ballpoint pen in unusual ways, Chamberlain's paintings of modernist architecture call attention to a humanist approach to design and its effect on the way we experience spaces. Chamberlain was born in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania and received her BFA from Rhode Island School of Design in 1991. She's performed at the Hirshhorn Museum and the Museum of Modern Art. Her work has been exhibited at Dodge Gallery, 303 Gallery, and Nodler Project Space in New York, among other venues. She's the recipient of many prestigious grants, has been reviewed in publications, including Art Forum, The New York Times, Art in America, and her work is represented in numerous public and private collections. Kristen Leachman, hello. <laughs> Kristen's paintings are noted for repositioning abstraction, figuration, and geometry, making seamless connections between the subliminal and sublime. Her current project, 50 Forests, explores both pattern and symbolism in the growth formations of trees throughout America's 50 states. Born in Washington, DC in 1966, Leachman spent her early years in rural Virginia and now lives in Los Angeles. She earned a BFA in painting from Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island in 1988, and an MFA in production design from the American Film Institute in LA in 1991. Leachman designed Senzini um, Na, um, What Have We Done? Academy Award nominee for Best Live Action Short Film in 1990, and her paintings have been presented in one-person exhibitions at the National Museum of Women in the Arts, Washington, D.C., and Laguna Art Museum, Laguna Beach, California, and will be presented in long-leaf lines at the Georgia Museum of Art in Athens in 2022 to 2023. An oral history with Leachman included in the Smithsonian Archives of American Art is included in the uh, American Archives of um, American Art in Washington, D.C. Ron Labre is an artist living in Asheville, North Carolina, which must be beautiful right now. Ron is yes. a conceptual artist known for paintings, drawings, and sculptures about time and popular culture. Labore's work is scientific and digitally influenced using both abstraction and realism to discuss topics within mass culture, shared history, 
globalization, and time. Labre has shown in major exhibition spaces for over 20 years, including the Vincent Price Art Museum, Pacific Design Center and RAID projects in Los Angeles, in Chicago at the Navy Pier Exposition, and the Suburban in Miami at Pulse, the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, and the Down Museum of Contemporary Art. Internationally, he's lectured about his work and exhibited in the Netherlands, Ireland, Japan, Taiwan, and the Hungarian National Academy of Science in Budapest, and a permanent mural installation at Rennes to University in Rennes, France. Currently, Ron holds the position of Associate Professor of Painting and Drawing at Western Carolina University. Bonnie Peterson is a visual artist investigating environmental and social issues using embroidery. Peterson's personal and political subjects have followed the trajectory of her life experiences from family and human rights issues to outdoor adventures and environmental science. Recent collaborations with scientists on concepts in fire ecology, atmospheric science, permafrost, and other geosciences motivate her work. Peterson has exhibited widely in solo and group exhibitions in the US and abroad, including the Museum of American Folk Art, Museum of Design in Atlanta, Fresno Art Museum, Yosemite Museum, among others. She has been the recipient of numerous artist fellowship awards from the Illinois Arts Council, a grant from the Illinois Committee of the National Museum of Women in the Arts, and other honors. Peterson had four National Park Artist Residencies. Her work is in public and private collections, including the Museum of Art and Design in New York City. She holds a BS from the University of Illinois at Urbana and an MBA from DePaul University. Originally from the Chicago area, Peterson recently relocated to Houghton, Michigan, where she has a studio. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished artists. So today, tonight, um, good evening, we are going to talk a little bit about um, the artist as a futurist in the post-COVID world. I'm not sure if we're really ready to say post-COVID, but if we're thinking about futurists, I guess we can talk about a time when COVID um, will, let's just say, lessen um, and won't be as much at the forefront of our lives. And so I thought it would be um, nice to um, look at the artist's work as we're in conversation because that way you'll get to see uh, what they're making and just go through a series of questions um, and be in conversation with one another. So my first question um, for the group is um, sort of what were you making before COVID and has the pandemic been a time of inspiration and innovation for you as an artist? Have you found that you've been changing and um, how how has this been happening who would like to to start oh uh, i'd be happy to start okay great ron yeah uh thank you thank you lisa um so there there we get to see some of my images uh, the first, when I was, uh, right before the uh, pandemic began, I was doing a lot of residencies and I was doing abstract work um, as I had been for 20 years. I had been uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, taking data and historical information and then arranging them in uh, kind of a, a timeline experience. Uh, so uh, a lot of things were color coded. Um, and then uh, when the pandemic happened, uh, I couldn't do that anymore. These, this is an example, a small example uh, of what I was doing. They're routed out using a CNC router. And that, uh, that technology is only available through like a social mean. You know, I have to go to a residency or a university or some maker space that would be available to make these. So with those all being closed down, uh, I found uh, a, uh, an opportunity to shift. Um, so it was something I was thinking about doing, trying out some, uh, going into uh, oil on linen, uh, doing something that was not so technologically uh, dense. Um, so I was, um, I moved into uh, oil on linen, uh, but used the same information and arranged it in the same manner temporally uh, on the canvas. So um, 
the titles are, you know, kind of these oblong kind of poems or narratives. And then, uh, uh, I don't know, I get to do a little bit more self-reflection in these. Uh, sometimes I bring along uh, autobiographical moments. Like in this case, um, there's uh, my second Halloween, uh, second Halloween mask. Uh, so uh, these are things that, um, that I hadn't yet explored uh, in the abstractions that I was able to do in the oil paintings. Great, thank you. Someone else? Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I think that for me, my work is about community connection with um, always cultural heritage through the interactions with technologies that we are having and the architectural surroundings, right? All of this together. And I think that the pandemic for me has been a point of truly self-reflection uh, for my work. And I think COVID has caused us to retreat inward, uh, all of us. And that been strengthening the diverse ways that we could communicate, you know, and connect with technology as a result. We all have gotten much better with it. So I think for me, that was uh, how I uh, had connected. Hey. Who would like to go next? I'm happy to go next. Um, hi, and thank you so much, everybody. Um, I uh, did, uh, this is an image of uh, a show I did in Los Angeles prior to um, the pandemic. I think this was 2018. Um, and my work focuses on architecture and how people live and the need to kind of find moments of um, of calm and often what the result kind of ends up being sort of uh because it's sort of empty the spaces are quite empty they sort of can be almost lonely feeling and during the pandemic um i moved physical spaces i moved up to the cat skills which was much quieter from brooklyn and i ended up reaching out to my community with a question which was send me images or descriptions of places that gave, gives you a sense of hope and calm. And this was a question I asked in a psychiatric facility in the Netherlands during a two month residency there in 2013. And the question just seemed ever relevant. Um, and I was given both descriptions and images and put together uh, composites. The results were a series of paintings, the one and the result image um, is one of them. Um, and and uh, I think I think what's happened really with the work is it's become much more about the present day and much more about um, uh, contact with people and spaces rather than spaces that purely resonated with me. Mm -hmm. um, and there's more conversation, and there's more and and the work has become kind of more intimate, in both in size. That was a kind of a forced situation. Um, but I think also topically, I think I, I just have more kind of contact with the, the, the people in spaces that I'm working with now. Hmm. And I think that's going to continue. That's so interesting because it seems like um, the opposite of what you one would have expected to happen during COVID and isolation. And, you know, so many people felt alienated and separated and, um, it sounds like, well, it sounds like a lot of you found um, opportunities to connect to both your work, yourself, and, and in your case with others during this time, um, which is interesting because time is such a strange phenomenon um, and we often feel like we don't have it. <laughs> and so suddenly to be in the midst of COVID, it was, I think we all experienced time in such different ways. and. Um, for artists, I imagine that um, it gave you a kind of space that you don't typically get um, to really um, think about your own work uh, expansively. Uh, and um, who, who else would, would like to speak about sort of the before and during of, of your work? Yeah, my, my paintings prior to COVID um, were pretty much focused on the 
organizing patterns in vascular tissues of trees, um, but only in California uh, and forests in California. So I, I had had the whole um, 50 forests idea brewing um, for probably only a month before uh, COVID hit. And um, then I just decided during the pandemic to expand the project to all 50 states, um, which really, you know, the, the lockdown really solidified all that. And it almost, in a way, gave me the courage to do it because it was kind of like, you know, what the heck, right? We don't know what's going to happen here and why not just take a really bold risk in terms of how I work and where I work um, and getting out of my comfort zone. So I was very grateful for that. And, um, you know, now I've kind of identified it as a, as a life's project um, mm -hmm. in representation and abstraction and painting, but um, with the whole twin commitment of um, climate change. So, um, you know, the time I had in the early days of the pandemic, um, really allowed me to develop and activate this. And I then, you know, had enough mileage. So I got on a plane and I went to this longleaf pine forest in Georgia. Um, so I spent many weeks there in the early part of June of 2020. And um, it's one of the most biologically rich um, ecosystems in the world, second to the rainforest. And then it became the subject of my upcoming exhibition. <laughs> so it all just sort of snowballed for me. And, you know, I just try to stay really centered and, and um, kind of make the most out of it. But I agree with Rebecca that it, it did. It almost like forced me um, out of my whole studio um, comfort isolation booth. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I guess I would just say uh, I wasn't that isolated during the pandemic and my work has such a huge time length for uh, research and development that the only change I really see is that uh, before the pandemic, I was looking at climate change data in one way and post pandemic, uh, there's just a whole lot more urgency and I've gotten more involved in the politics of climate change and the UN documents and the hypocrisy. So um, the, the one that's showing here, uh, Arctic sea ice is satellite imagery talking about the actual reasons why the um, Arctic sea ice is decreasing. And so I'm, very technical in my work and I'm trying to get people to think more technically and make sense of the math behind complicated uh, algorithms and the actual science that comes from a data collection and ends up in a graph. And this is another another example. Um, and this is on the nature of fire. Uh, and you're using embroidery and silk on velvet. Um, how did you sort of how'd you come to the materials and how do they relate to um, your your subject matter? Uh, this was a artist scientist project and uh, the relationship map of fire ecology variables is extremely complex. So um, the compact nine months that I had to produce something, which ended up being almost 70 inches uh, by 90, uh, was pretty, um, it's just a complex engineering masterpiece. <laughs> Thank you. And I wonder, so I, I, you know, we're, we are um, sitting in this moment of, of opening up, it seems across, across the United States and some of the world. And, um, and this, this panel is uh, talking about what might 
the future look like in terms of a post-COVID world? Uh, and I'm wondering how you think about your own work in relationship to the future and some of the critical issues. Um, I think you've spoken a little bit about, uh, about these ideas in terms of climate change, in terms of communities, in terms of sort of personal, uh, personal investigations, and also um, utopian ones in terms, of, uh, in terms of some of those beautiful um, Bauhaus-like works that, that you've done. And so I'm wondering what, what people think about this notion of your relationship to the future and whether or not whether or not you feel like you have any responsibility to to address that with with your work going forward. Well, I just feel a huge sense of urgency to communicate and broadcast and challenge uh, people at all levels. I mean, climate scientists are about to go on strike because they're so discouraged by the massive amounts of data and the tiny amounts of change or even effort. Right. And do yeah. you feel do you feel like your work gets out in in the kinds of places that you need it to in order for people to think about um, and to think about these issues more and to to change their habits uh, or you know yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I have a exhibit coming up in Chicago in October at the Peggy Notabart Museum. So I, I mean, I'm always looking for more venues, as is everybody else. Yes, that's that's normal. I think. Yeah, um, thank God I have connections in Chicago because I live in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> does live Does living in that kind of environment affect? Um, affect your thinking and your your process and and your subject matter at all or do you feel like it's just giving you the space and the quiet <laughs> that you need in order to make your work well i'm not here that much <laughs> i am here uh maybe six months out of the year or and then i travel a lot so yeah i yeah. think i'd go crazy if i didn't get out yeah yeah, um, Gurmanisa, what do you um, what do you think in terms of your work? Well, I think I used to travel extensively, you know, to create and install my work and, and to lecture as well. So uh, I think, however, the COVID restrictions, you know, have really altered, uh, you know, my usual process that I, I will have it regularly, right? So um, these actually, as we have mentioned before, uh, have really altered, you know, the way that you, it's mostly my usual way of working. So these all have given me more time, you know, to experiment uh, in my studio that I was not as much and, and time to evolve as a human being as well, right? So I began to accept uh, a smaller scale, you know, private commissions that they were at the same time uh, closer to home. And that had, was a big challenge for me because I was obviously used to do much more a larger scale. And, and then lately I have just uh, realized that I have been working a lot on projects that surrounding uh, well-being and mental health as well. And how exploring the architectural space and the light around affect, affect a lot of communities and the individual well-being of all of us at the same time. So it has been a lot of, um, I think, for me, wonderful changes because it just keeps helping me to keep on evolving. And in your work, um, in, in this one in particular, is this in mm -hmm. Um, in a, a home or is it in a business context? Uh, well, this is actually um, a collabor collaboration that I had with an um, uh, Israeli architect and is um, 
is in the lobby of, uh, is in New York City, is on 82nd and 3rd Avenue. And it's a permanent piece, it's an indoors, and it's at the entrance of the building, it's at the atrium of the building. And so, and you... the, the, yes, so, the, and then the one before, I think that it was, uh, you know, this one, for example, is in Prospect Park. And this one was one of my favorite. It was, of course, you know, pre-pandemic. And it was really lovely to see how all really gathered, you know, inside and around and the piece. At the same time, it was very close to the band shell. And for um, all of us that we know Prospect Park, they had a festival during the summer. And there's a lot of different performances and bands that they go. So. Uh, the activation, the communal activation, it was, you know, quite wonderful to experience. And do you, know. I'm curious about, um, you know, using light and, I mean, it's such a, it's such a responsibility in some ways in terms of, of climate and energy and has, has climate change affected the way you think about sort of your, your carbon footprint with, with light, um, using light and, how does that, what have yes. you thought about that? Of course, of course, Lisa. You know, uh, I used to work many, many, many years ago. I started working in light with theater lighting. Mm -hmm. And um, because at that time, uh, the LEDs were actually kind of forbidden. It was, you know, they were quite, quite pricey. We are talking about in uh, perhaps pro probably 2000, right? 2001, 2002. So I started working with theater lighting, but I never truly liked it because you had to change the uh, filters and the light itself every three, four months. But with the LEDs, actually, uh, I had work um, that it has been uh, without even changing any power supplies for the last 15 years since I started working. I think I started working 2004, 2005 with LEDs. So I, um, I'm always actually everything what I do is custom made and specifically for the project. This one that you have actually, that you're showing now, it's um, what I was referring before, that it was an opportunity for me to do a piece for a private collector and in, in a home. And so, believe it or not, uh, it made me realize how much work it was. I cannot tell if it was, you know, even much more deeper the research and development that it went behind, you know, this work, because you know the if you see on the image, it's uh, the wall is curved, right? Mm -hmm. So and the domes are flat, so you could imagine all the engineering that is behind those domes to make it sure that they become flat and part of the wall. So. Um... <laughs> Thank you, Ron. What about you? Well, that's uh, when I uh, was uh, coming into the pandemic, I was working with a lot of technology, like I had said, and, uh, you know, I was working with uh, high density urethane and um, CNC routers, uh, a lot of technology. And um, I felt like uh, when, it, when that all shut down, I'm guys, you know, as um, as uh, Graminessa had said, that, that I was doing a lot of traveling as well, uh, and the residency. So when that dried up, I had to, uh, I had an opportunity um, to kind of uh, try some things I was interested in experimenting with. It's something that I had done, uh, you know, going into uh, graduate school. Uh, I loved it, to draw, and I had gone uh, so far towards the future of what painting might be uh, by. Uh, generating digital images that were then routed out and I basically never touched them. Uh, it, it became to the point where the idea was manufactured and I never had to really touch the object. So uh, I went to the other extreme and picked up a paintbrush again and started working with the oil paint. So um, I think that you know, that allowed me to kind of uh, revisit uh, those uh, original impulses uh, that got me interested in art. Um, like I said, a lot of the uh, the images they can become a bit more personal. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a there's a real shift 
um, a way like how I was discussing abstraction um, through color coding. Um, and as you can see in this one, uh, okay, let's stop with this one. Uh, let's go back one. Go back one. Yeah, back one, please. Oh, wait, no, we have to go forward. This one? Oh, boy. There you go. That's perfect. Okay, great. Oh, wait, we're on the toe bone. Go back one more. Sorry. Oh, toe bone. <laughs> Perfect. Oh uh, yeah. So, um, so, so this is uh, a CNC routed. Uh, it's out of urethane. It's a really high density urethane, and um, then it's it's airbrushed, um, and it's it's rather thick. It's about two inches thick, uh, or deep, as I could say, and it's relief, and it's a uh, timeline. Uh, objects closest to us uh, are in uh, our time, and then as it goes back farther and more blurry, uh, information. Uh, uh, goes further back on the timeline. So uh, that same system carried over into the oil paintings. So if you were to go back to the Frankenstein mask, perfect. Um, this was uh, during the pandemic. I was still thinking about abstract patterning in the uh, with those stripes in the background and the way that the roses are colored, mm -hmm. uh, that they are they're coded, um, and so it was very it was a it was an intermediate jump uh, into the the final one, the last one that I had uh, sent you, um, and that's the toe bone one. That's the um, the last one. This one. There you go. Right. This yeah. One, and so, go ahead. Yeah. This one feels so surrealist to me. You know, just sort of having the bone floating over clover, and you know the. I think it's tile, you know, and the patterning of it and the color um, palette is really incredible. Um, and I can see, I can see sort of the abstraction coming in. Was there a, um, how did you, how did this come together for you in terms of, of just developing it? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is interesting because as the uh, pandemic uh, it shut everything down, I was working with a French artist. Uh, and I had this idea that we would make a reliquary uh, around Neil Armstrong's toe bone um, because it, it, that would be the, the first uh, portion of a human being to touch the moon. Uh, and uh, in that, it was something that we all shared, uh, almost like a religious reliquary. Um, so anyway, so we all got shut down, and I still had this idea in my head. So I, I was going to paint with the reliquary, but I thought it was kind of stiff, and I thought it's really not about that. It's really about the bone. So, uh, yeah, and then I was watching, I was watching uh, during the pandemic, I was watching a, a documentary about uh, the faking of the moon landing um, and how that that was, uh, uh, clues were disseminated in uh, the movie The Shining, uh, that that was actually uh, faked. Uh, so Kubrick gave us clues. And uh, so on the carpet there, that's the shining carpet uh, from the hotel. and. Um, the idea is that either the toe bone is going to uh, evoke conspiracy, or you could also consider it a good luck charm. <laughs> I guess that's the clover, right? <laughs> nice, really nice. So, you know, I'm curious with this piece. It seems um, the way the way that you've made it, and talking about sort of time um, in relation to sort of what's closer, or what's further away. Uh, I'm also struck with this piece how it appears like a topographical map um, in in the layers and sort of the contours of it. Were you thinking about that at all when you made it? Yeah, I, you know, I, as uh, my first paintings were maps, and they were maps where uh, both reality and popular culture intersected. Like I would map. Uh, Fred Flintstone, you know, in Bedrock, uh, Colorado, uh, and then his colors would be there on top of the colors of the map, and that would be an abstraction. Um, so it was a, a simple way to talk about how we might be connected through the idea of pop culture. Right. And uh, so mapping has always been uh, at the center of my work, uh, and so I would do maps and then charts, and then eventually I started thinking about timelines and putting the information in certain layers um, away from the viewer. Uh, but you could position the viewer either in the past or the or the, the current uh, um, and look either way. Uh, and then I could adjust the um, uh, the visibility so it looks like it might be farther away in either time or memory. 
but I also uh, liken these to something similar to uh, the face on Mars uh, that we project into them and look into them uh, and we see what we want to see. Uh, but whenever we look at an actual topographical view of that mound on Mars, what we find is it's just an eroded mountain. So mm -hmm. the um, so the idea of the timeline moment uh, when we reflect on it topographically is similar to the mountain on Mars. Thank you. Um, anyone else thinking about um, sort of sort of the future and um, how how your work is is moving towards that? Um, if, if you expect, if you feel, I mean, it sounds like a lot of you have changed, uh, have shifted a bit in terms of the way that you're making work as a result of the pandemic. Um, yeah, I think, I think for me, I, it became so much more research-based mm -hmm. um, and, you know, really focusing on our dependence on the extraction of resources um, from the present and the past, right? So just research, researching sort of like the whole timeline of how things got, you know, how forests started to be used and abused. So um, I think for me that was really um, important to have that time to to do so much more research than I've ever done on it, up for a, one painting ever, right? Just to to be in that space to do it. And what are some of the? I, I know that you're you're traveling a lot and you're going to sort of experience the places and observe them. Um, what type of research are you doing? Are you looking at sort of scientific studies? Are you looking at? Um, is it is it mostly based on the places where you're going and your experience with them, how, what types of research is, is sort of feeding into how you're thinking about this series? Um, it's multi-layered. Um, I'm first pretty much um, doing the history part, finding the old books, finding, you know, how, how large a forest was originally. Um, and then, you know, sort of the breaking down of it who used it you know the one currently um it was used for shipbuilding it was used to make the railroad across the west um it was you know absolutely tapped out for um all the rosin and everything for turpentine um in that whole period um and, and then, you know, really important just to go back even further, just, you know, the indigenous people on the land, how they utilize the land, um, what's their relationship to it today. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been really an important part for me. And then there's the wildlife piece, sort of what's been the evolution of the wildlife, how have they survived um, in the forest, how are they surviving now. Um, it's just all very tied in and it kind of just leads where it leads, right? So you'll start reading some book and then there's this interesting part and it takes you off on another adventure and suddenly, you know, I'm reading about the 1600s, right? right. And then, and then some all of a sudden appears a, you know, a group that's working today on this amazing, you know, uh, preservation of a very endangered woodpecker, right? So it's just this, these tentacles that go off and um, that's been a really rich experience. So it sounds, I mean, so many of you, your work is research-based and you're really, um, it, it's interesting. I mean, that's the, you describe sort of the experience of research so beautifully in terms of the way it moves us through time and different, you know, going into the past, trying to put the pieces together um, to understand to understand what's happening now, whether it's, you know, in relationship to, to your own identity and experience in the world or, or others, or, you know, it also um, in, in relation to our environment. So, um, so yeah, I wonder if anyone has any questions or would any of you like to um, ask questions to one another? <laughs> Well, I, I feel like there is such an urgency right now to um, 
to engage like in every way like why are we making this work right. why are we even are, why are, why put more stuff in the world has been a question for me i think because i also work in fashion i have to ask that question that's a whole other panel i could be on right but <laughs> i i think um and i'm working a lot in that area but mm -hmm. it, it there's so much conversation that has to happen. You know, there's, and I think that we are as artists, I'm finding myself invited into rooms as a, as a, as a sort of a soothsayer <laughs> in, in certain ways, you know, and, and there's a reason that we focus on the kind of work that, that any of us um, here on this panel, I mean, I think each of our work has something to do with mining the past and, bringing its relevance here and now and trying to kind of speak to the audience about something that feels urgent to us. Um, and I think that if we can ground ourselves in that purpose-led practice, that really feels like what I feel relevant in a way that I didn't feel relevant as much before.